metrics and the measurement of academic outputs are a fact of academic life. It can feel like individuals, departments, and even whole institutions are constantly being compared with others based on the number of outputs they produce and the impact these have. But is this system really working in the modern open research landscape? Do all the changes involved in open research mean that we should look again at both how we use metrics and how we can measure impact more widely? This video will discuss some of the key metrics that researchers are likely to come across, explore how they're calculated and begin to question what metrics and research assessment will look like in modern academia. First, it's important to take a step back and consider what it is we really mean when we use the term impact. How will you know you've achieved it if you don't know what it is? Impact is a term that's hard to define with any real consistency. It means different things to different people. So an output or a piece of research can have a profound impact on one person and no effect at all on another. It can also take many different forms depending on what you're looking for. For example, are you interested only in numerical impacts or do you want to know more about any changes that your work has caused? Impact is also impossible to attribute directly to any single source. There are so many different factors which influence people and events that we can't often say with any real certainty that a particular intervention has made the crucial change. There are also many different types of impact to consider. Researchers tend to focus on academic impact to the exclusion of all other forms. And although this is understandable given the competitive nature of academia, we do need to consider what we're missing out on by doing this. Considering the impact of research on wider society is becoming increasingly important, not just due to exercises like the REF, but also due to interest by the public on how academic outputs are funded and shared. Looking beyond the academic bubble, Think about how the results of this often, pub often publicly funded research are being used in areas such as health, education, or the environment. This extends to the potential influence of research over policy by institutions or even governments. How's the latest research shaped the way that we all live our lives? All of these differences combine to make impact impossible to measure in any real standardized way. And yet we have to try. One solution is to use surrogate measures to determine whether an impact has been achieved. So we might say that if something has achieved X outcome, then it can be considered to have had an impact. Each area selects its own surrogates, and this will vary hugely between sectors of society and between disciplines and institutions. In academia, the surrogate measure has traditionally been metrics. Metrics are numerical surrogates for the impact and often the quality of research. They've been used for many years as the main method of assessing and ranking research, comparing the careers of individual academics, or even justifying the existence of entire institutions. The model we're going to discuss is based on work by Roma and Borchardt to identify levels of metric and helps to demonstrate both the range available in academia and what they aim to measure. Many metrics are targeted at what the model calls individual scholarly contributions, the output that you want to assess, such as a journal article or a conference presentation. The next level looks more widely at venues of production, essentially where the output is published. In academia, this is often the journal title that an individual paper is published by and is one of the most common metric levels in use. There are also metrics that are assigned to individual researchers to compare them with colleagues or to monitor the progress of a career over time. And these are often included on academic profiles as a perceived sign of success. The final level looks at wider groups and institutions. It might look at how author metrics contribute to the overall score of a department, and in turn, how this reflects on the overall institution. Institutions such as universities are often compared on the basis of key metrics to produce rankings and league tables that you might have come across. It's important to consider the different levels which metrics set out to measure so that when we use them, we're actually comparing like for like. Too often, those involved in research rely on the impact measures they've always used to make assessments, but these are not always the most suitable choice.
let's take a closer look at some of the main uses of metrics in academia. Metrics are often used as an indicator of research quality, with the idea being that the higher the metrics of an individual scholarly contribution, such as a journal article, or a venue of production, the title it's published in, the better the output is seen to be. One major issue with this approach is that it often confuses the assessment of two different levels, the contribution and the venue it's shared in. Just because a journal title is prestigious doesn't automatically mean that the research shared in it is of any higher quality, although that's often what people think. As a result, researchers often use metrics when choosing where to publish or share their work. They often aspire to publish in those titles with a higher metric score in order to boost their reputation and open their work up to a large audience. Individual researchers might have their performance analysed and compared to that of their colleagues, and metrics usually form part of this assessment. They can also be used to measure the performance of different departments or institutions and benchmark these against one another. These types of comparison are often part of the recruitment process, with metrics being used to help evaluate potential candidates for academic positions. They can also help with grant applications, leading to increased opportunities for those able to demonstrate higher metric scores. Some researchers use metrics as a way of identifying potential collaborators for their future work. As with career advancement and performance review decisions, those who have better metric scores are deemed to be those more worthy of collaborating with. All of these potential uses of metrics can be combined to create evidence of impact. Certain metrics can be used as surrogates for the impact of an individual piece of work, a researcher, or even an entire institution. Metric measures in academia can be broadly divided into two subsets, bibliometrics and altmetrics. Bibliometrics are numerical surrogates of impact. They look at things like the number of times an article has been read or an individual researcher has been cited. Researchers will recognise some of the measures listed, such as the H index and the journal impact factor, and you'll often find these attached to sources such as databases of articles or journal websites. Bibliometrics tend to focus on traditional academic outputs like books and journal articles, but you'll see them used on other materials as well. There are several different bibliometrics, some established and some new, and each one is calculated in a slightly different way, which can make establishing an accurate number difficult. For example, the number of citations from one database for a particular article may be higher than those listed by another. As much of the methodology used to calculate bibliometrics is proprietary, it can be hard to know which is the true number or whether overlap in database content has caused these differing metrics. Another problem with bibliometrics is that they rely solely on numbers with little or no context. Take, for example, a citation count. This merely counts the number of times an item has been cited, but doesn't look at all at the tone of these citations. So should something cited 20 times as a piece of poor research be given more recognition than sound research that's only been cited five times, just on the basis of numbers? We'll take a look at four of the most common bibliometrics that researchers are likely to come across. The journal impact factor, the Eigen factor, citation analysis, and the H index. It's important to make an attempt to understand how these measures are calculated so that we can use them critically. The journal impact factor, or GIF, is one of the most recognizable bibliometrics. It's managed by a company called Clarivate Analytics and calculated by dividing the number of citations in a year by the total number of articles published in the previous two years. This helps to demonstrate how often the output of the title is cited, with the higher the number, the higher the impact factor being. The calculation is based on information from Clarivate databases, which do tend to be weighted towards the sciences and social sciences, and so might unfairly bias other disciplines. The journal impact factor is easy to understand and has a good reputation, but as citations take time to build up, it's not always a good representation of the impact of newer journal titles. The Eigen factor was developed to counteract some of these issues. 
It also bases its calculations on the number of citations received, but gives each citation a weighting according to its source. The more perceived prestige a citing source has, the greater its weighting will be. So citations from popular journal articles will result in a higher score than those which are less well read. It also looks at citations over five years instead of two, which gives papers a chance to make more of an impact. However, the calculation is heavily influenced by this perceived prestige of the citing title, something which is decided by those who manage the metric and is less than transparent. Citation analysis is a simple count of the number of times a work, a researcher, journal title or department has been cited in the academic literature. It's a measure used to assess a wide range of outputs and is one of the easiest to understand. However, there's the potential for confusion over exactly which sources have been used in a count and whether there's any duplication. It's also a measure which lacks context both in the tone of the citation and the discipline. For example, a citation count of 10 might be seen as high in one discipline, but low in another. And then finally, there's the H index. This assesses individual researchers by comparing the number of outputs they produced with the number of times each one has been cited. The outputs are then ranked in order from highest number of citations to lowest and the point at which an output has more citations than its ranking is known as its H-index. This metric is often used to track the progress of a researcher over time to show how their index, index number increases, but this can also unfairly represent early career researchers who've not yet had the opportunity to build up their publications list. Altmetrics or alternative metrics were developed much more recently as a way to address some of the issues with bibliometrics. They aim to provide additional context for the numerical metrics assigned to a piece of work and to take into account newer methods of sharing research like mentions on social media. Each different platform where research is mentioned is given a weighting which helps to contribute to the final score. So for example, the inclusion of research in a news story would have a higher weighting than a mention in a tweet. Additional context for the mention is offered through the Altmetric Explorer tool. This lets users dig deeper into any citations and look at exactly what is being said. For example, reading a social media post to judge whether it's a positive or negative mention. It also allows researchers to see the geographical spread of their work by showing the location that mentions originated from. This could be particularly useful if a researcher isn't a regular user of these tools, but still wants to use them to monitor impact. The altmetric score for any piece of research is represented by a colorful donut graphic. Each color on the wheel represents a different type of mention with the total score in the center. Users can select one of the colors to further explore the mentions made. The main advantage of altmetrics is that they're good at gauging the tone of the opinion behind the metric to give some context. Unlike traditional citation-based methods, which can take a while to build, altmetrics can also be used immediately after publication, although this will only ever offer a snapshot of the information at the time. There are some other disadvantages to bear in mind. Altmetrics look at newer methods of sharing and promoting research and rely heavily on social media. As not all disciplines or individual researchers use these tools, this may unfairly bias the score of a piece of work. And at the end of the day, altmetrics still offer a numerical assessment as an indicator of impact. So are they really any better and any more of an improvement on traditional bibliometrics? Although metrics are part of academic life, it's important to use them critically and be aware of their limitations, especially if you're going to use them as a measure of impact. Metrics of any type are numerical measures and numbers often mask a bigger story. At worst, they could be manipulated whilst at best they can leave out an important context. Although measures such as altmetrics do attempt to address this, at the end of the day, this is all still reducing potential impact to a numerical measure. And there are many impacts out there which just can't be quantified in this way. 
Each metric is calculated in a slightly different way depending on its sources, meaning that it can be hard to get an accurate, complete measure. This lack of consistency makes comparisons difficult and potentially unsound. Not all metrics are open about how they're calculated, meaning that researchers have to take the number as it's presented without fully understanding how this was reached. What many people don't know is that traditional bibliometrics, such as the journal impact factor, were in fact developed as a tool to help librarians select the stock. If we consider the life and career decisions that are now made on the basis of these metrics, we do have to question whether these measures are still fit for the purpose they're being used for. If we're going to award jobs and grants on the basis of numbers, should we not ensure that they're fit for purpose? Any numerical measure offers the potential for manipulation and gaming, whether this is intentional or not. Academic practices such as excessive self-citation and gift authorship can help to artificially inflate numbers. There's also something known as the Matthew effect. This theory claims that the rich get richer, basically because you are expected perhaps to cite certain authors or papers which are known in a discipline in your own work. The citations for these keep on growing. This often happens at the expense of other works and results in further inequalities in the scholarly ecosystem. There are also other potential biases to be aware of. Some metric measures focus heavily on journal publications, which gives an unfair picture for disciplines where journal publishing is less common. Academic publication is only one measure of research success, and it's unfair that so many are judged by it when there may be valid reasons they haven't published as extensively as others. Think, for example, of researchers with caring responsibilities or those from marginalised backgrounds who might not have had the same opportunities or support as others to help them get published. This is an issue that's been brought to light as we consider the impact of the COVID pandemic on publication rates worldwide. If you were homeschooling or had extra caring responsibilities for a couple of years, this will probably have impacted your ability to publish, which will then impact your metrics. But is this really a fair judgment? And finally, some metrics like the H index take into account the publication record of a researcher over time. This often unfairly promotes older researchers who've had more time to build up publications and become established. These biases show the importance of adding context to your metrics so that people can make informed judgments on your record and potential impact. These issues with traditional metrics have given rise to something known as the responsible metrics movement. This began about a decade ago and advocates that metrics should be used more ethically as one part of a wider picture of impact and that researchers and their work should be judged on their own merits, not the reputation of the publications they appear in. You can have a good piece of research in a journal that's considered less prestigious and poor research in a well-known title. The important thing is to look at the work itself and make your own assessment. There are three key documents which have contributed to the responsible metrics movement over the years. They all cover broadly the same areas, albeit with a slightly different emphasis. DORA, the San Francisco Declaration on Research Assessment, was developed in 2012 after a sort of growing acknowledgement that the current system of metrics needed to be improved. DORA calls for the piece of research to be judged on its own merits, rather than just on the strength of where it was published. The University of Cambridge signed DORA in 2019 to demonstrate the institution-wide commitment to the responsible use of metrics, but individuals and groups are also free to sign the pledge on their own. The Leiden Manifesto was next in 2015 and builds on the basic principles of DORA. The key element of this document is that it calls for professional judgment to be used alongside metric measures to assess research outputs, rather than just relying on the metrics alone. The final document is the UK-based Metric Tide Report, which also came out in 2015. This was commissioned by the UK Forum for Responsible Metrics to look at the reliance on metrics in assessment exercises like the Research Excellence Framework, or the REF. Although each of these documents is subtly different, they do cover broadly the same themes. The crucial point to remember is that while they're advocating change, what none of these documents are suggesting is that we should stop using metrics altogether. 
just that they become only one part of a large toolkit for measurement. Responsible metrics is also about making sure that any metrics that are used are open and transparent in how they're calculated so that researchers can understand what's being measured and exactly how they're being compared and that metrics should be regularly reviewed to ensure that they are still fit for purpose. Finally, all the documents make the point that the place of publication, the venue of publication and the levels of metrics model that we looked at earlier should not be used as a surrogate measure of impact, but that instead the research is judged on its own merits. So how is this going to impact you as the researcher? An important element of impact that's often forgotten about is how all of these changes are going to impact on new and current researchers. At the moment, the impact, the academic system is in two camps. We're moving increasingly towards wide adoption of the open research practices that responsible metrics is a part of, but at the same time, current researchers are still subject to traditional methods of measurement. The good news is that an increasing number of institutions and funders are moving towards open research processes, so responsible metrics are now more likely to be considered. And remember, there is still a place for metrics, it's just about using them as one element of a wider story. If you want to start thinking about the wider impacts of your work now, there are some actions that you can already take. Make a note of any impacts as they happen. This will make it much easier to refer back to things when you need them, rather than trying to remember everything that's happened over time. Something might seem like a small impact when it happens, but it could build into something bigger by the time you actually come to report it. Be broad in what you define as impact and look beyond the world of academia. Consider how your work has made an impression in wider society as well as with your peers. Think about these impacts in context. Your paper might not have had an incredibly high read count, but if you got some positive comments after a conference presentation, which led on to a collaboration, this is an impact worth recording. Think quality, not just quantity. You can create an annotated CV. Sometimes these are referred to as a narrative CV, and they're essentially records of your achievement which help to add context to otherwise short entries. For example, they allow you to reflect on your career and your projects to date and explain any areas which you feel have had an impact either on you or the wider world. These CVs are a great reflective tool and come in handy if you want to apply for any future jobs or grants, but they can also help you plan how to promote your work in future. You might find that your research is having an impact with a different group than you expected, for example. So you can maybe think about targeting them in any future projects. And then finally, think about the long tail of impact, the impact chain. Impacts can be a bit like ripples in water. They start small, but they can grow to be quite wide. You might find that an output has been an unexpected hit or that something you did a while ago is getting renewed interest. Think about what this can tell you about the audience for your work and how you can leverage this to create even bigger impacts in the future. If you have any questions about modern metrics, you can reach out to your more research support team and we'll do our best to help.